Working at an amusement park, the stagecoach and the mime. Part 3 The series written by Girl from the Crypt I work at an amusement park where only half of the actors are actual actors. Since I touched on the one not actor from the western section who left a lasting impression in my last post, I think I should introduce the other monster from Twinvale Point, if you could even call it a monster. However, I need to get some things out of the way regarding the pretender's origins before I get started. None of us actors know where they come from or what they are. All of them have been here long before any of us started working our current jobs. Then again, Nathan might know something. He is the other actor from Twinville Point, but I'll get to that in a second. The not actors come in all shapes and sizes, literally. Sure, most of them share some common traits. For example, only two of them can talk, and they are extremely restricted in their ability to do so. The other not actor from the Wild West town can barely be described as a single living being at all. It's an Old West stagecoach pulled by two large, beautiful chestnut stallions. The stagecoach itself does not have a coachman. That's where Nathan comes in. Nathan is the actor assigned to the stagecoach. He is the only one who steers it. He sits on his coach seat all day, wrapped in an old ragged blanket. He doesn't talk much. In fact, the only times I've ever really spoken to him, we just exchanged quick greetings. Our interactions never went anywhere past a very awkward introduction. He offered me a dead fish handshake and we just stared at each other for a little while with none of us knowing how to start a conversation and that was it. For all I know, he never leaves his coach seat either. Sure, he probably goes home sometime in the evening, but I've never seen him leave. If Mitchell hadn't told me he was an actor, I'd probably think he was a pretender himself. He's sort of creepy too. I sometimes wonder if maybe the stagecoach has turned him into part of itself. If he might be a pretender. The stagecoach only really starts getting weird at night time. During the day, Nathan just drives it around Twinvale Point, much to the amusement of our visitors. The horses act really friendly around them too. However, as soon as the sun sets, they change. The horses go from docile and gentle to raging and furious. Their eyes start to glow with a blinding white light, making them look alien and eerie. I've seen them buck and even wildly chase through the different parts of the park pulling the stagecoach along with them as if it had no weight whatsoever. Therefore, it is Nathan's task to take the horses to their fence meadow in the back of the park come nightfall, where they cannot be seen or reached by visitors. According to Mitchell, who apparently learned a lot about Nathan's strange occupation from working alongside him, the chestnuts refuse to be separated from their stagecoach. Whenever someone tries to take off their harnesses, they start going completely berserk. They'll buck and kick and neigh as if they were being slaughtered. Like I already said, Nathan and I don't talk much, meaning that my contact with the stagecoach is also highly limited. So most of the time, I only spot it in its normal peaceful state. I've touched on this in my previous post, but I really love Twinvale Point for its dry, old-timey charm. I'm a big fan of Wild West movies too. I've caught myself a couple of times sneaking after the stagecoach in hopes of seeing it do its magic. But my curiosity was never rewarded. Instead, the only times I've ever witnessed the horses act up were when I was unprepared and busy and therefore couldn't really enjoy it. I feel bad for liking to watch the stagecoach turn weird, but the few times I've seen it were insanely impressive 
it really did look like something out of an old movie. I didn't want to come back to the Laughing Cowboy, but in regards to the stagecoach, I guess I have to. I have noticed his tendency to, in lack of a better term, mess around on it. One time I saw him standing atop its roof. There were a bunch of visitors standing below him, taking pictures and hollering. There was a little boy amidst the crowd who seemed to be really into the stagecoach and the cowboy actually bent down and lifted him up so he could stand on top of the carriage with him. I remember the kid being insanely happy about it, clapping and squealing like crazy. I must admit the scene was a bit heartwarming. Other times the cowboy will just lay or sit down on top of the roof and ride around with Nathan. Of course the latter can't be bothered with that, although I have seen him try to shoo him off by occasionally making use of his horsewhip only to provoke signature fits of laughter from his unwanted passenger. My disadvantage in this is that the cowboy in turn appears to have noticed my own tendency to follow the stagecoach around, resulting in him staring at me from atop its roof with a wide smile on his face. I can't stand his gaze for long, so whenever he's around the carriage, I make it a point not to get too close to it. Speaking of things I cannot stand, I simply have to mention the other not actor from the candy section. While the Sugar Plum Fairy is scary enough as she is, this one doesn't really have to get aggressive to make me run for it. Let me preface this by saying that I absolutely hate mimes. I don't know what it is, but I just don't like them. I don't think they're entertaining and their face paint just looks weird. Plus their exaggerated motions and expressions are sort of unsettling to me, but it's not like I'm actually scared of them. However, if there is one mine worth being scared of, it's the one of the candy section of our amusement park. The actor assigned to him is Anne. She's a sweet bubbly girl who I get along with splendidly. Her costume is a clown outfit, but it's really cute, pink and frilly. Not one of those creepy ones you see in horror movies. The kids love her and for some reason that is just absolutely beyond me. They also love the mime. He spends all day hopping around his part of the park, making balloon animals for the children and handing out candy to them. However, not unlike the laughing cowboy, the mime has these days on which he's in a bit of a strange mood. Thankfully, one can determine what kind of state he's in just by looking at him. So all Anne really has to do is assess his behavior in the morning and then decide on whether to let him out to roam the park for the day. He's the only human-like pretender who sleeps in a sheltered cage instead of a trailer or something similarly comfortable. The mime shelter might have a bit of a prison cell look to it, but at least there's a roof above it and there's blankets and pillows and stuff. He is simply too dangerous on his bad days. It's very easy to tell when he's not fit to be let out. The first time I saw him like that was on a cool morning in early June. We were expecting a ton of visitors that day, so the other actors and I had decided we were going to be using our walkie-talkies. I was in my and Darius's break room, the latter having not yet arrived, and in the process of dressing up when, to my surprise, the portable radio came cracking to life. Hi, anyone here already? Anne's cheerful voice came through the small device. I grinned. Hi, Anne. Glad I'm not the only one who's early, she replied. Hey, could you come over? I kinda need a second opinion here. Oh, trouble with the mime? I asked. Yes, yeah, sort of. I'm not sure if I should let him out today. He seems fine, but I have a bad feeling about this. I can't explain why, but I'm not really sure. Well, okay then, give me a minute, I'm headed over right away, I assured her. 
I was not fully dressed up yet, but I didn't want to keep Anne waiting. So I walked over to the candy section in my black frilly Monster Hunter dress shirt and yoga pants. A combination that caused my co-worker to laugh at me for about two minutes straight before finally getting to the point. She led me over to the mime shed, which was hidden behind a row of booths. Looking through the bars of the cage, I found the mime standing in there upright and perfectly still. He looked back at us with a thin smile. He was very quiet. I feel like he's messing with me, she explained in a low voice when we were out of earshot from the pretender again. He's never been so calm before. He's usually way more excited. Yeah, but come on, you really think he's like smart enough to try and deceive you? I asked. I always thought you two were on good terms. Yes, but I just can't say for sure this time. Do you think I should let him out? I frowned. We can't keep him in there if he's not acting up. I mean, he hasn't done anything wrong. I think it wouldn't be fair. I've never seen him be hostile before, but this really doesn't look too bad. And sighed. You're right. I guess I was just worrying too much again. She reached into a pocket and retrieved a small key which she turned inside the door lock and then continued to unlatch the two additional deadbolts. She opened the door and the mime stepped out. Hey, she greeted him. Sorry I kept you waiting. He didn't react. Instead, he sunk to his knees and threw his head back. Oh crap, I could hear Anne mutter before he opened his mouth. A choking sound came from somewhere in his throat as his lips and then his jaws proceeded to part wider and wider. What he did next is nearly indescribable. Have you ever seen the ballet dance the Spider by Milena Sidorova? It's amazing as a performance, but when the mime dropped onto all fours with the corners of his mouth stretched all the way to his ears, and began to hiss at us, it was not quite as pretty. He was standing on the tips of his fingers and toes, his back bent at an unnatural angle. I cursed myself for not having dressed up completely before leaving the break room. My whip might have served as a good means of defence. The mime scuttled past us at an alarming speed and Anne and I exchanged quick, knowing glances before sprinting off after him. I can't believe he actually tricked me, Anne panted. She was a bit out of shape and unable to keep up with me for long. I'm sorry, I shouted as I passed her, continuing to pursue the not actor. The mime was incredibly fast. I found myself wheezing and gasping for air after about eight minutes of following through the candy section. Eventually, I had to stop to catch my breath, and before I knew it, I had lost sight of him. I cursed. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow vanish behind the stage the Sugar Plum Fairy always dances on. She had not been let out yet, so the stage itself was deserted, but I was certain I could hear the tapping of feet behind it, I made my way around its back, but he wasn't there. At least that's what I thought before something wet and warm hit my head. I slowly looked up to find the mime hovering above me. He was holding onto the stage's metal light fixture and staring down at me. His mouth still opened unnaturally wide. Drops of saliva were dripping from his tongue, which was hanging out from his maw. I stood frozen in horror for what felt like an eternity, not daring to break the stare of the pretender. I could feel my heart pounding wildly in my chest and my hands beginning to tremble. The mime seemed to slowly, ever so slowly, lowering himself towards the ground. Suddenly I saw something fly past me out of the corner of my eye and collide with the mime's head. 
The knot actor let out a sharp hiss of pain and I took a step back just in time as he had lost grip on the light fixture and fell to the ground. I took my chance and threw myself on top of him to hold him in place and instantly began to yell for Anne to come help me. The thing that caused the mime to fall was a small but heavy rock. I discovered it lying on the ground next to me while I was waiting for Anne to arrive, still holding the struggling pretender in place. To this day I have no idea who had thrown that rock, but whoever it was probably spared me a lot of physical pain. I'm not sure if I would have stood a chance against the mime if it weren't for this short but effective distraction. Either way, I can only repeat that I am not fond of mimes whatsoever and the one we have in our park sure isn't helping that. Also, Anne has agreed to never take my advice again. As you might expect, I kept apologising to her for a long time after that incident. Lastly, I should probably mention that I talked to Maxine about the Sugar Plum Fairies enclosure. She explained that the trailer she lives in is very secure, albeit old, and that it holds a bed for her to sleep in. Some of you suggested it might be helpful to give her a bigger space to stay in for the night since all she seems to want to do is dance around, meaning that she would not be as opposed to returning in, into the trailer. To me and Maxi, this makes total sense and it would also spare us a lot of trouble. We have decided to try and approach Dale about this issue but I'm not sure any type of conversation with him will lead to positive results. I think I've said it before, but he's a douche. Still, trying doesn't hurt, and that's what we're going to do. I guess we'll just see how it goes. Working at the amusement park, my shady manager. Part four. Series is written by Girl from the Crypt. I work at an amusement park where only half of the actors are actual actors. After my last post, I initially wanted to introduce the two pretenders from the Hollywood section today, but in light of very recent events, I changed my mind. It's very late as of me writing this. Let me preface this by explaining a few things. While the park is closed for the season, that of course does not mean we are allowed to stay home. There are two reasons for this. For one, it would be utterly irresponsible to simply abandon the creatures in our care and also we would not get paid a single cent. Paid leaves don't really exist in Dale's book. That means they do exist, but only on paper. Therefore. Even though the park is completely void of visitors, each of us have to come in at least for a couple of hours a day to check up on the pretenders. By the way, they aren't locked up at the moment. We decided on leaving them running around freely since it would be torture to force them to stay in their enclosures during our absence, so of course we need to be alert. I don't really know when the others come in, so I got ready in the morning and arrived at the park around early noon. I was aware I would probably be the only one there, but I admit I like the quiet. Plus, you're never really alone with not actors at large. I obviously have my whip with me. Ever since I got around to learning how to use it, I've grown rather fond of it. It looks cool when I crack it is what I'm saying. Dale had given me and the other actors extra keys for the employee entrance so we could get in and out effortlessly. I was not surprised to find the park completely deserted. While I was not sure where the other pretenders were at, I did not waste any time on trying to find out. Instead, I determinedly headed for Mr. Scratch's cage. As expected, I found his door wide open, but the sock puppet was lying inside nonetheless, peacefully snoozing away. 
He's grown a bit lazy these days. He must have noticed me approaching because as soon as I reached the cage, he perked up and clumsily rose to his feet. He sluggishly came trotting out to greet me and I took my sweet time petting and scratching his shiny fur. I didn't need to put him on a leash today. Why would I? There were no visitors around he could potentially pose a threat to. We peacefully walked alongside each other for about half an hour. We did not encounter any of the other not actors, which was very refreshing. Plus, it was nice being at my usual workplace in my comfortable everyday clothing instead of the costume for once. Afterwards, I fed him some raw chicken which he gobbled down in one go. I was really enjoying myself so I wanted to keep strolling around, but the sock puppet apparently had a different idea. He returned to his shelter where he plopped down to take another nap. That was fine with me though. Why not let him have his lazy days? I for one decided on taking another walk around the premises. There was not a soul out on the plaza or the streets. The fun houses looked even creepier with no one around. I figured the other not actors were taking the same approach to their newfound freedom of movement since I had yet to come across any of them although I was willing to bet that the Sugar Plum Fairy was up on her little stage dancing, the thought of the pretenders hiding somewhere was rather unsettling though. Before I knew it, I had left the streets and reached the grassy part of the terrain on the outer edge of the park. I thought about going to the meadow and checking out the stagecoach but changed my mind when I suddenly heard someone murmur. My mind instantly wandered to the likes of the mime and I reached for my whip. However, upon looking round, I found that there was nobody there. Still on high alert, I proceeded to sneak along the fence perimeter until I finally spotted a man with his back turned to me a short distance ahead. I squinted but soon recognised the familiar slouching posture of my manager, Dale. A bit taken aback but relieved that there was no pretender around after all, I walked up to him. He didn't notice me at first, rather he seemed to be focused on something he was holding in his hands all while continuing to mutter inaudible phrases to himself. At first, I barely paid any attention to his behaviour at all. I figured that now was as good a time as any to talk to him about the Sugar Plum Fairy's enclosure, so I put on my finest good employee smile and quickly approached him. Good morning, I called out to him. His reaction was unexpected. He let out a startled gasp and spun round with wide eyes. Upon seeing me, he seemingly relaxed a little. I could now see the object in his hand as well. It was a slim, worn out notebook. As soon as he noticed me staring at it, he slammed it shut. Shit, he growled, running his hands through his hair. What the hell's gotten into you? Why do you have to sneak up on me like that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you or anything, I said trying to look like I actually cared. What are you doing? I added curiously. None of your business, he replied, eyeing me suspiciously. What did you see? He asked after a little while. Just you talking to yourself while holding a book. Which is weird. That's why I asked. Dale nodded and appeared to be a little more at ease. Repeated, none of your business. He sounded a little friendlier this time though. So, I began, Maxine and I have been wanting to ask you something, but before you say no, please hear me out. Dale sighed exasperately. Look, I don't really... His voice trailed off. Never mind, what do you want? Ignoring his slightly aggressive tone, I explained our suggestion about a larger enclosure for the Sugar Plum Fairy. 
See where I'm coming from? It's obvious all she wants to do is dance. If we give her more space, she'd be less reluctant to being locked up at night. And I don't think I have to tell you that that would save us a lot of trouble financially. Think of what it would cost to have an actor or another employee attacked and needing medical, medical attention. On top of that, now that there's no one visiting the park, we'd have plenty of time to rehouse her and let her get used to her new home. With that, I finished my speech. Dale looked at me pensively for a few seconds before clearing his throat. I admit, you do have a point. I beamed at him. Does that mean we'll do it? No. What? But why not? I asked. First off, we'd have to buy a bigger trailer and those things are expensive. No one from higher management is going to want to pay for some luxury van only for that tutu creep to dance around in it. And also, and I'm going to be frank here, who cares? Well, you sure don't, I muttered. Dale chuckled. Don't tell me you actually thought I wasn't going to see through this. It's for your own good. You shouldn't treat monsters with too much affection. If you start thinking of them as humans, things here will go downhill in no time. Sure, some of the ones we have here might be a bit more agreeable, and for them, I'd be willing to comply. But the fairy? nah -uh. Despite his condescending tone, I tried one last time to convince him with kindness. But couldn't we at least look for a better option? Maybe we'll find something cheap. You said yourself that we have a point. Come on, please. Dale rolled his eyes. I hated myself a little bit for pleading with him like that. Look, it's not my decision to make. I get it. But Maxine and I would be very, very lit relieved if we could rehouse the fairy. Do it for us then. He squinted. Are you hitting on me? I felt my stomach drop at the sheer thought. I had tried to be nice, but this was it. I was so done with his crap. Not to be rude, but the laughing cowboy has better chances than you, I hissed. Dale threw back his head and laughed. Oh, I bet he does. This is it, I thought. I'm going to murder my manager. You must have sensed it, because he suddenly backed up a little and raised his hands. Chill out, girl. Let's not get physical here. If this is so important to you and Maxine, I'll meet you ladies halfway. If you two can find a new, better enclosure for the Sugar Plum Fairy, I'll help rehouse her. I'll give you some money for it, but the park won't be able to pay for more than a third of it. We're not making profit at the moment, so we've got to be careful with our savings. I felt myself relax a little. That's actually nice. Thanks. I can work with that. Good. Now that that's out the way, would you mind leaving me alone? Yeah, um, what is it you're doing here anyway? I repeated my question from earlier in hopes of receiving an answer now that he was more cooperative. I already told you, it's none of your business, he replied. I decided to leave him be, but I kept watching him from a safe distance. He walked the length of the fence, enclosing the park, nose buried in that worn notebook of his. I soon grew tired of observing him, so I returned to the sock puppet's cage to play with it some more. The image of Dale murmuring to himself, while staring at his writings, did not leave my mind though. In the back of my head, I was conjuring up the strangest theories about what he could be doing. Was he conducting some sort of ritual? Part of me wondered whether the notebook might be holding incantations of sorts, even though that sounds sort of ridiculous. I made my way home in the late afternoon. The sun was already setting as I headed out through the employee entrance. To my surprise, I encountered Maxine there. She told me she'd come to check up on the Sugar Plum Fairy. 
She had apparently been at the park in the early morning hours already. She doesn't have a lot of work on her hands these days. I've never seen the fairy eat or drink or let on she required anything a normal person might need to live. As I said, all she does is dance. I relayed my conversation with the manager to Maxine. We've already asked some of our friends, including our co-workers, and it turns out Mitchell's dad has a very large trailer he wants to get rid of. He's willing to give it to us at a low price, so if Dale keeps his promise, we should be able to reaccommodate the fairy in it very soon. I have since done some research on Dale too, at least I tried. I know it's not a very sophisticated way of snooping around, but I googled his full name only to get no results other than him being listed as manager on the official website of our amusement park. I'm starting to think that maybe I should try and get my hands on that book he was carrying. I have not given up on finding out about the monster's origins yet, and if he is not going to answer my questions, maybe I'll just have to resort to more direct measures. Each time I am asked about incidents in the theme park that have caused that casualties, I instantly remember one specific, extremely heartbreaking event that took place nearly two years ago. Since a lot of people have expressed interest in these kind of happenings, I believe this might be a good time to talk about it. We do not have casualties as often as you might think. Surprising, I know, and it certainly isn't because management is particularly careful or something. This incident is more or less connected to a not actor I introduced last time, the mime. As you know, this creature unsettles me quite deeply and for some reason actually likes him. She says he's only creepy on his bad days and that I should remember all the times he's been docile. She's delusional. Then again, I can kind of understand her. When you are assigned to a certain object or being, it's immediately a personal matter and it can kind of start to grow on you. Me and my sock puppet are the perfect example. The night in question was a special one. I don't remember exactly why, but I do know there were some celebrations going on and that there was going to be a firework. For clarification, we had already had fireworks on multiple occasions and none of the not actors ever appeared to be bothered by them. Actually, I think I even saw the nurse look up dreamily at the sky regarding them one time one of the only occasions on which she had shown any sign of consciousness. Nobody could have expected what happened and I don't think it had anything to do with the special show. The visitors had gathered on the main plaza of the Hollywood section. All the lights had been turned off and even the ferris wheel wasn't shining in its flashy colours anymore. All was quiet until the fireworks began. I remember standing a bit off sides next to Darius. We were staring at the night sky expectantly. When the first golden sparks illuminated the darkness, the whole crowd, including us, began to cheer. Soon the square was filled with noise. The voices of the guests and the sounds of explosions should have drowned out everything else. Except they didn't. I remember distancing myself from the crowd because I thought I had heard someone scream. Not the normal happy kind of shouting of the fireworks audience though. I tried to ask Darius if he had heard it too, but he did not even hear me. He was too caught up in the moment I guess. Nonetheless, I made my way over to where I had thought I heard the scream had come from. I wandered the booths, main street and restaurants. Almost everyone had gone off to watch the fireworks and there was only few employees left in the shops. At first my search yielded no results. Still I continued looking. Maybe there indeed was somebody in need of help somewhere after all. I don't remember where I found her exactly, I just know I rounded a corner and there she was. 
she was lying flat on her stomach in the middle of a side street between two restaurants. I don't think I've ever seen so much blood in one place before. I immediately ran up to her, not having quite fathomed yet that it was already too late. I turned her onto her back to find that her throat was torn, not slit like one had used a knife on her, more like a wild animal had clawed at her neck. She was one of the restaurant waitresses. I recognised her uniform and apron, even though her clothes were covered in blood. I must have been standing over her body for a full minute before finally getting a grip on reality again and rushing off to get help. But just as I was turning around, I spotted a familiar black and white stripes out of the corner of my eye. For a split second, and I'm absolutely sure of this, I saw the mime cowering behind a trash can farther down the street. The park was shut down immediately after I had reported my discovery. The police were called. We, the actors that is, were tasked with gathering the pretenders in the back of the park where the cops wouldn't find them. They didn't come looking though, no one ever did. The mime acted very inconspicuous that night. There was no blood on his clothing or anything, and Anne kept assuring me my fear of him combined with the horrifying experience of discovering a dead body had caused me to see things. I had no choice but to relent. Plus, there was no way of proving anything. It was a bit unlikely that the mime could have gotten from the candy section to the Hollywood one and back in such little a time, I'll admit that. Still, knowing that he's prone to deceive people, I would not want to discard that idea entirely. Dale seemed at least to, to believe me a little bit. He ordered to keep the mime in his cage for two entire months after that incident. According to him, it was to assess his behaviour, but I think it was more akin to punishment. When he was allowed back out, he was as peaceful as can be. I still think it was him though, after all, who else could have done it? On the paper, the casualty was not a casualty at all by the way. The official story is that the waitress had chosen that night to commit suicide and that it was Dale who had found her. Of course, that was complete nonsense. I don't think most outsiders would ever question this story. For all I know, the waitress lived by herself and had no closer relatives, so there was no one there to question it in the beginning. As for the police, I can only imagine how much money was paid under the table that night to keep the finer details from getting out. I've been suspecting management to have some sort of deal with the local officials anyway. The park lost none of its prestige and in the end it's like the whole thing never happened. And that's exactly what bothers me. The death of a person being swept under the rug like that is terrifying to me whether it was the mime who took her life or not. Wow, that was an awesome instalment. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, be sure to pop over to the author's Reddit profile and drop them a line. Tell them what you think of their story. The link to their Reddit profile will be below in the description. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed my narration, then please feel free to share the video, leave a comment below, and don't forget to throat punch the subscribe button and jab that notification bell. That way you'll always be informed of each new upload. And don't forget, where fear is, happiness is not.